It has a nice aesthetic. It's good for the kids. It's good for the adults. <laughs> Hello, friends. My name is Brandon Dayton. I am your humble narrator. Welcome to my top 10 indie games of 2019. This is the first recap that I've done of like the year end list, but it seems like a really good idea, especially with as many games as I tend to play throughout the year. I forget some of them, and it's good to look back and remind myself just how good they were. So there's some games that are not on this list simply because I haven't played them yet. Um, things like Disco Elysium, Baba Is You, Katana Zero, I definitely have an eye on because of the Steam Awards. You can check out my thoughts on those in the Steam Awards video. Uh, but yeah, I haven't played them quite yet, and that seems a shame, but uh, they won't be on this list just because I, I can't pass judgment on them. I don't know anything about them aside from somebody else's experience, which doesn't give me the full story. Um, in addition to those three, Wilmot's Warehouse is something that's caught my eye, basically sorting boxes and bringing boxes to customers that ask for certain boxes, and since I used to work in a post office, I kind of identify with that one uh, more than I should. More than the normal human should, anyways. Uh, so, that one I'll probably pick up at some point. Outer Wilds is another one that came out near the end of the year, and it just... It just has rocked the world. Uh, a lot of people are talking about this one. It's definitely on my radar. So at some point, I'll probably also try and pick that one up. In addition to Sayonara Wild Hearts, which m meshes a whole bunch of genres and just blends them together super nicely. You go from like rhythm game to hack and slash to whatever else. And it, it definitely has a really cool vibe to it. Um, so yeah, that would probably rank on this list as well. But I, I can't speak on those really because I, I haven't played any of them yet. So maybe next year, although they won't be on that list, uh, but I might make a video for them at some point if I'm able to. Uh, if I find the time, which I'm trying to make more time for YouTube and stuff like that because my channel has been super inactive this year, but that's, that's for uh, another video. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next video that comes out on my channel. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing mostly indie games because largely indie games are what I played. AAA has been largely uninteresting to me this year. Um, if you're in my Discord or on my Steam friends list, you might see that I've been playing a lot of Red Dead Redemption 2 and Halo Master Chief Collection, which both came out this year, but they aren't on this list because of their AAA status. But I've really enjoyed each of them for uh, completely different reasons. I didn't have a chance to experience Halo back in the day, so it's really nice to kind of go back and see what I missed out on, and holy shit did I miss out on a lot. I still kind of suck at the multiplayer, but uh, I'm getting better, slowly but surely I'm getting better by putting in my time with Halo. Red Red Redemption 2, a lot of the quests and stuff are super disappointing, but the open world is really hard to not like and the attention to detail is just amazing. There was uh, this this lady of the night in Valentine that killed a dude and she's like, can you get rid of the body? I'm like, okay, sure. Throw it in a pig pen, come back to her. She's like, cool, here's all the money I got, 12 bucks. I'm like, that's not enough. So I go report it to the sheriff. Couple days of game time later, I go uh, riding past the gallows and that lady's hanging up on the gallows. So I felt like a pang of guilt, tried to shoot her down. Uh, she ended up dying anyways and you know, I got chased by the, the sheriff and whatnot, but it was super exciting and any game that can make me feel like that, um, yeah, it, it definitely deserves at least a nod. So, all of those games, really, that's that's like another top 10 list all on its own. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we're gonna get into the actual top 10 list now and hopefully I haven't rambled enough to, to lose anybody quite yet because here we go. Number 10, Wargroove is what is going to start this list out, and my my, what a delightful title this was. I played it at the very beginning of the year, I almost forgot about it for this list until I was looking through some releases and I'm like, oh yeah, I did play that, oh yeah, it was pretty fucking awesome, wasn't it? So I kind of revisited it, and uh, just to refresh myself, and oh man, I ended up playing it for like two to three hours, <laughs> it's, it's so super addictive. Um, I was really big on the Advance Wars series back when Advance Wars was 
getting regular releases, you know, for the Game Boy Advance. And uh, Wargroove gives me the same vibes, you know. It's really easy to sit down and play Wargroove for just 15 minutes on your lunch break or something, but also addictive enough that you could sit there for a few hours quite easily. Like, you have to make yourself stop instead of doing one more turn. Just one more turn. It's got that one more turn feel to it, which is really, really nice. I also like the aesthetic, uh, sword and board and magic, rather than the massive amount of mil military tech that is uh, implemented b by Advance Wars. Uh, yeah, Wargroove feels really nice. You got your archers, you got your swordsmen, the dogs act as scouts. It's definitely a cool aesthetic. I really love the vibe of Wargroove, so that is why it is number 10 on this list. Number 10 might seem a little bit low for a game this awesome, but the UI definitely needs some help. Um, I, I was kind of stricken by, by how wonky it is. I don't enjoy the UI at all. The art itself is amazing, but it definitely needs to, uh, to have a UI makeover in order to, to get higher on this list, at least in my opinion. So yeah, I think it's in a good spot. It does get a mention, and uh, I really did enjoy my time with it. So that's what I got to say, let's move on. Number nine, Sea Salt, Lovecraftian reverse horror game, basically summoning a bunch of creatures from the depths and sending waves forth onto your enemies basically uh you know lovecraftian horrors and cultists and people will try and shoot back at you so maybe you have to bring the wave back around another way and you know not go through a little choke point where they're all just trying to blast you it's a really short game but the time that i spent with it i really really enjoyed um basically i compare it to something like overlord i played overlord back in the day and i really had fun just sending forth waves of minions onto my enemies and war grew or fucking and sea salt gave me a lot of the same vibes as that so i i definitely enjoy the lovecraft mythos um but it's not really what pulls this game through for me i really like the pixel style and of course the the reverse horror the being the bad guy and sending the waves onto your enemies is Really a nice touch. Of course, the music work is nice. The sound work is nice. It's just a really, really good game. If it passed you by, I'd suggest checking it out. I will state that the price point is a little bit high. Um, so if you're able to catch it on sale, that is that is when I'd pick it up. If you're paying full price for it, you'll probably be a little bit disappointed by the length. But I'm hoping that another Sea Salt is in the works. Um, I'm not sure how well it performed, but it definitely made an impact on me and enough of an impact to, to get the number nine slot on this list. So great job, Sea Salt. Number eight, Sunless Skies. Another game that I played very early in the year. It has this Lovecraftian mythos to it as well. Very, very lore heavy. Uh, if you don't enjoy creating your own trade routes and stuff like that. You might not enjoy Sunless Skies, but I really enjoy the uh, resource balancing and the economy of the game, being forced to choose sides and uh, line up with, with one faction or another in order to uh, not get your ass kicked when you're going through their territory. It's really, really nice. It's, it does feel like you're living in an entire world. Uh, just the entire world is your playground. It's, it's all been built for you and you can do with it as you will. I really also like the combat in this game. Uh, you're chugging around on a steampunk train in space, which is <laughs> a pretty out there concept, but it works well. You know, you, you put your Gatling gun on the front and you gotta fight off the baddies that are trying to uh, steal your cargo and stuff like that. It definitely was a game that stuck with me throughout the year. I've revisited it a couple of times. I revisited it once again for this list, did a little run, and found out that I had lost all skill. Um, but that's okay, you know? That's that's part of the game, is is getting your shit handed to you, which, you know, I, I'm not, not too proud to admit that. But yeah, the, the aesthetic's really nice, the, the lore is super deep. If you're into lore, I definitely suggest picking up Sunless Guys. Again, the price point may be a little bit high, but if you enjoy the game, you will get many, many hours of gameplay out of it, much more than something like Sea Salt. Um, so yeah, check it out if it seems like it would appeal to you. 
Number seven, kind words is just the most wholesome thing that I've probably ever experienced in my time gaming on the internet. It's an anonymous letter writing service. Basically, you can post a request and say, hey look, you guys, I'm having this problem. I really don't know what to do about it. I'm feeling depressed about this. And anonymous strangers on the internet will go through the postings and write you letters, uh, basically at least letting you know that they identify with your problems and that you're not alone. And some of them even offer like helpful advice or as helpful as advice from an anonymous stranger can be. Um, I've made about four postings and was pretty satisfied with the the responses to it. Uh, in addition to that, there's not really any trolling, which surprises me. The, the devs have been really active and uh, getting rid of trolls and stuff like that. So just the community is super wholesome. The game is ultra enjoyable. I'm not going to say fun because you are just sitting there writing letters. But it does feel good when somebody thanks you for, for a letter or you get a new sticker or something, which is one of the incentives for writing letters. I do have all of the stickers now, but uh, hopefully they'll implement some more stickers in the future. Uh, but really, I don't do it for the stickers, man. I do it because it just feels good to help somebody, you know what I mean? Somebody who is experiencing a situation that I've been through myself, you know, and maybe you have just the piece of advice for them. It doesn't hurt to reach out at least a little bit and yeah pen an anonymous letter to somebody who needs your help i i think it's a really really nice thing uh that that this is a game <laughs> you know it just amazes me that that something like this has gone so long without being and i'm very grateful that it has been now so definitely an awesome awesome game breaking almost the number five slot which is really impressive for a game that's technically not even really a game but it definitely is an amazing indie title at least in my opinion so that is why i placed it so high on this list number six alchemy garden hey you like alchemy hey you like gardens <laughs> it's basically an open world exploration sort of game very very laid back um i've been i've been digging on like either chill games completely chill games or games that uh, are balls to the wall basically you know some days i want something that's gonna kick my ass and other days i want something that just allows me to unwind from all the work that i've been doing so alchemy garden is one of those that lets me unwind just a little bit pick some plants plant some plants brew some potions open a shop you know uh it just it just has a really nice feel to it and you can also of course customize your garden stuff like that so if you're if you're one of those people that can enjoy a, a slower bit of gameplay without you know tooth grindingly nail gripping action then alchemy garden is probably something that you would enjoy as well i know my wife probably wouldn't enjoy alchemy garden but it uh it has a nice aesthetic it's good for the kids it's good for the adults uh <laughs> I definitely enjoy my time in Alchemy Garden. I come back to it relatively often. It's sort of a new release, so I have yet to uh, find exactly where it will fit in my gaming rotation, but I've, I've opened it up two or three times, spent a couple hours in it each time, and it definitely, uh, you know, did what it's supposed to do, I believe, and that is help me to just un unwind, de-stress, relax, you know, there's there's not a whole lot of uh, optimization or anything to it. It's just you play the game how you want to play it, and I think that's absolutely awesome. So great job to Alchemy Garden. Almost breaking that number five slot. So now that we're getting up there, let's see what the top five is. Number five. My time at Porsche. Well... It's kind of the same as Alchemy Garden, if you want me to be quite honest. It just has a bit more to do in it. You can, uh, of course, plant your plants and gather your supplies and craft some stuff, but there's also caves that you can explore and things like this. You can interact with the townsfolk, play a little game of rock, paper, scissors, uh, decide who you want to marry. That's right, you can get married in this game. Uh, it has a lot of comparisons drawn to Stardew Valley, which is a game that really gripped me for quite a good time. Uh, I, I think I put almost 100 hours into Stardew Valley, and 
I'm sitting at about 20 hours with my time at Porsche, but it is a really, really enjoyable game. I will say that the end game is a little bit lacking. Um, there's stuff that feels unfinished in it, and I don't know if they're going to come back and redo it or anything like that. They're like, hey, there's this secret room, and you go in the secret room, and it's just like, well, there's some leather couches in here. You know, it feels, it feels a little bit rushed in some parts, but, um... Yeah, I, I, I guess it's good for what it is. You can definitely go back and play it a couple different ways. Um, I don't guess that it's going to get an update because it is from the beginning of the year and yeah, a lot of time has passed and there's not, there's not really been anything done with that. So judging it for what it is, I, I think it's solid enough to take the number five slot for me. Um, some of the games I mentioned earlier that I haven't played would probably fit better in this slot, but as it is, my time is port. My time in Porsche. My time at Porsche. Yeah, in would be better than at, but I think the developers aren't aren't native English speakers. Anyways, it's a super good game, uh, despite some of the the lack of polish near the end game, and the voice acting is also a little bit uh, wonky. But the game itself is really really beautiful. Uh, reminds me of Stardew Valley. Again, another game that I could just kick back with which I really like. But that is the end of the relaxing games. All of the top four slots are games that uh, hand me my shit. So <laughs> I'm sure you guys will enjoy that. Number four. Blasphemous, amazing Metroidvania. Oh my God, I really love the combat in Blasphemous. It just feels so smooth, the art style feels so great, the story, it's its pretty good as well. I'm not going to say it's the most amazing story that I've ever heard, but it's got some edge to it, which I really like. It's got a dark, moody feel, and it brings back the, uh, the Castlevania feelings of old, you know, which is a, a feeling that I've been looking to recapture. So, I definitely love Blasphemous. I haven't played through the whole game myself. I've watched the ending. I did spoil it for myself, but it definitely is a game that I am going to sit down and finish. Um, the the first few minutes that I was playing it, I'm just like, my God, this is this is so good. How did they make it this smooth? How did they make the the hits feel that impactful? You know, these people definitely know what they're doing as far as development goes. I can't quantify exactly why it feels as good as it does but I am really really head over heels in love with Blasphemous um, and yeah the the rooms feel different which is some something that I have trouble with in, in Metroidvanias pretty often uh, especially things like Chasm you know Chasm was like randomly seeded uh, and it worked for what it was but a lot of things fell sort of short because it was randomly seeded so if you can make a game that is just built built to last then I think that's that's the secret the secret to success and blasphemous has done just that you can run through it um, probably once is enough but if you want to run through it again I'm sure it would still be a good time uh, yeah the art style the 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 feel of it the mood and of course the the way that everything plays is just it's top tier it's definitely one of the best metroid being is that i played this year so tip of the hat to blasphemous definitely deserving of a number four slot possibly even higher but <laughs> i love these last three games so fucking much number three risk of rain two wow they, they went from 2D to 3D, and it totally fucking worked. I think I talked about this one in the, the Steam Awards video. This was my pick for Better With Friends, which it definitely, definitely is. But even solo, you can sit down and just enjoy the hell out of it. I, I really love what they've done with Risk of Rain. The monsters, uh, still the same, but they perform differently in the 3D space. The classes, still relatively the same, but they perform different in the 3D space. The work that was probably needed to, to convert everything from 2D to 3D is absolutely massive, and it does feel like a, a different title, you know? Risk of Rain 2, they could have just done the same game with uh, more levels, more enemies, stuff like that, but they decided to add an entire fucking dimension. <laughs> and it feels so good to play. 
Um, I've unlocked most of the classes except for one. Um, and yeah, at some point I will come back and unlock that because this is one of those games that I boot up every so often when I just feel like kicking some ass uh, for 20 to 30 minutes and then and then I kind of get my ass kicked because you get overwhelmed by enemies and the enemies get stronger. Uh, you basically want to move faster. <laughs> move faster and collect more power-ups than the enemies are getting powered up, which is a fine balance uh, similar to the original Risk of Rain, but it works especially nice in, in the 3D space. So I, I can't say enough good things about Risk of Rain 2. If it looks like something that you'd enjoy, thing you would probably enjoy. I really like that low poly style um, and the level design is just awesome. Obviously, uh, once you beat the game, it loops you back to the beginning level. So, um, you know, it's not like outstanding level design. Obviously, it's, things are recycled somewhat. Overall, I think Risk of Rain is really, really awesome. I love what they've done. I absolutely love it. And uh, it's definitely worth full price, I would say. Go out and pay full price for this game if you haven't yet. Number two. Slay the Spire is number two. I think a lot of people that uh, keep an eye on what I'm playing would probably expect me to put Slay the Spire at number one because I've I've put about 30 40 hours into it it's something that I play relatively often I love checking out the daily challenges and trying to uh, trying to get on the leaderboard I don't I don't top the leaderboard by any means but if I could break top 100 then then that's a good day for me I really like the the three different classes and building those three different classes in so many different ways um, my favorite class is probably the the ironclad because he heals after every combat which is just an absolute blessing he has a lot of uh shieldy abilities and stuff like that uh damaging attacks that can can uh be buffed by by making a bigger shield for yourself which obviously also keeps the damage off you it's one of the the better classes uh the other one would be the silent that's like the most difficult one for me to master it took me so long to to get uh, clear with the silent, but once I discovered a shiv build, um, yeah, basically just infinite shivs in my hand. It was it was pretty easy. I think I I got to the boss and beat the the final boss in like two turns with a uh, with an infinite shiv build. So that was pretty fucking cool after so much struggling. And then the last one is that like weird robot thing, which is the easiest class to play, at least in my opinion. I I basically uh, started the game up, and my second or third run, I beat I beat the uh, the final boss with that little robot fellow. Which, uh, yeah, I guess I guess that's cool. I thought the game was going to be super easy because I got that that first easy clear, and then I did the ironclad, and I'm like, oh, it's pretty difficult. And then I did the silent, and I'm like, I'm so fucking. <laughs> I don't know how I'm ever going to do this, but eventually I did. And now you can, uh, you know, go back through and loop the entire fucking thing. You don't have to stop at the final boss, which I think is really cool, similar to Risk of Rain 2. It is obviously a roguelike, so once you die once, that is absolutely it for you. Uh, that The variety of enemies is super good. You have to have a tactic for each, each type of enemy and also each elite that you might encounter. You can, of course, avoid the elites, but if you face them, then you get a relic, and the relics make you stronger, so you want to collect as many relics as you can. You can also buy relics from the shop, but Slay the Spire is super fucking deep, um, and yeah, I, I can't stop myself from playing it. I, I come back to it almost every single day. That's how good it is. I at least check out the daily run and see if it's something that sounds fun to me. Um, at the very at the very least, that is, that is what I do. Uh, yeah, if I, if I want to get amped up for something, if I want to unwind from something, it kind of fits the mold of both of those types of game that I like to play. So I, I suspect Slay the Spire will be uh, appearing in my recently played games for a very, very long time to come. And it is without a doubt worthy of the number two spot on this list. I probably ranted too much about that. But before we get to the number one slot, probably a shocker. Uh, <laughs> I don't think most people are going to be expecting this game because I haven't talked about it that much, uh, at least publicly. My family knows all about it. <laughs> They're like, Jesus Christ, shut up. Stop telling me about this thing. But uh, it is super good. I'm, I want to go over some runners-up. 
Now, I did talk about some games that I hadn't played at the beginning that would probably rank on this list. These are the games that would probably go above number 10. If I were to make it a top 20, which I really did actually seriously consider. Honorable Mentions. Feudal Alloy. Amazing game. Uh, really, really fun. Super fucking hardcore, though. <laughs> Uh, you're basically a fish in a suit of armor, you run around, you get different upgrades, the upgrades change how your character looks, and obviously some are absolutely better than others, but um, the game definitely put me through my paces. It's probably a bit too difficult for the average gamer to, to pick up and succeed at, but if you're willing to push your way through, I think it's an awesome title. Mist Hunter. A fantastic first-person roguelike, of course, I really enjoy roguelikes and stuff like that. I played this briefly through, uh, what's that, library sharing on Steam, and I really did enjoy the time that I was able to spend with it. Unfortunately, I didn't think that it was worth the asking price. I haven't bought it, but um, I figured it was worth a mention on this list at least. Hyper Parasite, another one that I've uh, experienced through library sharing. I like this one more than Mist Hunter, kind of a top-down roguelike, got that pixel aesthetic which I obviously have a boner for, and uh, of course the story. The story is actually pretty cool too. Mist Hunter doesn't have much of a story that I could discern, of course that might be because I was also playing off, off somebody else's shit, so uh, don't take my word for that. Uh, 3000th Duel is another, it's like kind of chibi Dark Souls, you know? Uh, it's really cool side-scroller you know, slash your enemies up. I will say that the power-up system is not fantastic. Um, that's also something that, that bothered me about Feudal Alloy. It's like, okay, you hit something, and then you hit something harder, and then rank three. Oh, you hit it super hard. It's like, well, that's that's not really interesting, is it? It doesn't give me enough incentive to, to want to go out and level up. Um, also, the combat in 3000's Duel can, can feel a bit clunky. Uh, yeah, it's just the controls are a little bit chunky. It didn't feel 100% right to me, which uh, is the reason that I that I had to drop it off the list. It was close. It was close, but it didn't it didn't make it. No cigar. Uh, last two of these. Green Hell is another game that almost scraped its way onto this list. It's really fucking amazing. Open world crafting survival. It, I'd say it's like kind of similar to the forest, except set in the Amazon rainforest, which is a, a pretty cool setting. Obviously, you have to uh, fight off creatures and shit like this, but you're also battling against your own mind, and there's like a, a psychological component to it that you also have to combat, and it's, it's super interesting. I really like what they did with Green Hell. Unfortunately, when I played the game, my first taste of it was an early, early access build, and it didn't feel complete. Um, I've revisited it recently, and it is m leagues better than it was when I first experienced it, so I'm kind of sad that I jumped in it too early, and it, it put a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth, but I will probably make a video on this in the future. It's a little bit past its prime now. People are like, oh, I've seen it, but if you haven't seen it yet, it's definitely worth a look. I really, really like the forest. <laughs> not, the, not the forest. Green Hell. I really like Green Hell. Uh, I do like the forest too, but I, I'd say Green Hell is even more enjoyable than the forest. Um, you can go out into the woods, create a little fire, a little tent, uh, genocide the native tribes people if that's what you're, if that's what you're into, um, and then yeah, the the psychological component is really what puts it over the top for me. Battling your own mind, which is probably the biggest part of wilderness survival, is. Uh, is something that needs to be stressed so while it's not like outright boo jump scare freddy fazbear creepy it definitely has some creepy vibes to it and i i, I like green hell a whole heck of a lot i would say that is the number 12 spot unofficial 12 spot on this list uh number 11 spot would have gone to ape out oh my god fucking top down hotline miami style freneticism oh god it's good uh you're basically a crazy ape, you run through the level, fucking grab dudes, use them as a human shield, uh, make them fire their guns onto their allies and stuff. It's really nice. Hotline Miami without guns is what it is, and um, it's made by Bennett Foddy, of course. He's 
he's getting his his fair share of fame, especially after getting over it. Uh, had a bit of a viral sensation for a little bit there. Uh, but yeah, Ape Out is definitely better than getting over it, in my opinion. It's got a really nice art style to it, and the soundtrack is like uh, a jazz soundtrack, but it goes along with whatever you're doing in the game. So you throw a guy out the window and cymbals crash, or you smash a dude into a wall and it's like big drum beat kind of thing, which... I think really, really is what holds the game together, honestly, is the soundtrack. Uh, it's a little bit short, you can go kind of score attack with it, but honestly it, it wasn't enough to push its way onto the list, which I find slightly unfortunate. Uh, I just didn't enjoy it as much as Wargroove and Sea Salt, if you want me to be quite honest. Uh, but that's not to say that I didn't enjoy it. If, if you can find it on sale, because like I said, the game's a little bit short. so. You'll probably want to pay the sale price, but if you can find it for uh, a steal, then I'd definitely suggest snagging it because it, it is a fucking fantastic game. So, <sighs> we've, we've covered more than 20 games in this list. This wasn't my plan at all, but you know what? This is, this is the, the final, the pinnacle, the greatest game that I have played this year. And number one. Hades! Oh my god, I fucking love Hades, dude. This game came out of nowhere. I don't pay attention to the Epic Game Store, but apparently it was on early access over on the Epic Game Store. Nobody told me about this shit, and then it comes storming over the Steam, and I'm like, what the fuck is this? Uh, a Greek, Greek-saturated mythology roguelike? Like, you guys know, you guys know I played Apotheon for, like, the longest time, and... To have, to have another Greek roguelike, oh god, and this time it's top down, and this time you are actually a god, you're the son of Hades and you're trying to uh, break out of hell, which is super awesome, you fight a bunch of different enemies and stuff, and um, so far I've only gotten three layers in. So there's Tartarus, there's Asphodel, and then there's Elysium. If there's anything above Elysium, I don't know anything about that, but the three... The, the, the three layers have completely different types of enemies and completely different types of feels to them. And uh, obviously you can interact with other Greek gods from Olympus who are trying to lend you their power in order to escape from Hades. Um, you know, you've got, you've got Aphrodite who kind of uh, uses her charms to make the enemies weak. So you can uh, strengthen your attacks by weakening your enemies. You've got Athena and Ares. Athena's got more of a defensive feel. She allows you to like deflect projectiles. Uh, Ares, obviously, he's the god of war. He just adds more damage onto what you're doing. You got Poseidon. You got Zeus. Uh, there's so many fucking uh, different types of powers that are available to you. And even then, you can mesh two of them together, like uh, Hades and Athena. When their powers are combined, it allows you to inflict more damage when you deflect something, kind of thing. Obviously, some of the combinations are better than others. There's, you know, probably a build out there that's, like, optimal, but I don't care anything about that. I just have fun playing through Hades, uh, doing my best to power myself up in order to escape from hell. And the voice acting is fucking fantastic. The dialogue is, is really great. The you, you can collect charms and stuff from uh, people that you meet around Hades and rank up those charms, which gives you even more of an incentive to, to play through with something a little bit different. Different types of weapons that you can power up. Oh my god. And it's still early access. It's still fucking having stuff added to it, which is oh, it's mind blowing. I, I can't wait to see what Hades becomes. It's definitely not as laid back as something like Slay the Spire, which was number two. It is edge of your seat, fucking gripping the entire time. You you definitely want to uh, perform optimally, but oh man, any game that can do that to me and make me want to push myself like that is just definitely deserving of the number one spot. I can't I can't say enough good things about Hades. If you haven't heard of this game. Please check it out. If you enjoy Greek mythology, if you enjoy top-down roguelikes, um, I mean, God. Even the weapon choices. The, there's so many cool weapons. Sword, spear, bow, shield. They've even got, like, a fucking railgun. Oh, God! 
And then the more you use the weapon, the more like blood, whatever it is, you can get to power it up. Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe I sound like a fucking crazy person, but I am crazy. I'm crazy about Hades. So I will I will probably be making a video on that in the future. You can you can count on one of those videos in 2020. Probably if they uh, release like a big patch or something like that, I'll be like, hey, here's this game. Here's what's new in the patch. And I really love it if you didn't realize that already. But this video is getting a little bit long. I thank you so much if you've watched this far. Uh, it's going to be quite uh, a handful to edit, but I guess that's okay. It'll be worth it. We're going to start the, the new year out with a couple of videos and try and do this thing consistently because I did not do well in 2019 as far as video uploads go. So we're turning it all around. New year, new me. Um, well, kind of old me because old me was a lot more consistent. But anyways... Thank you, friends, so much for joining me on this journey. My top 10, almost top 20 indie games list. Fucking, what what, what a great year for video games. Uh, I don't hear many people saying that this was a great year, but it was, in my, in my uh, estimation, from my experience, it was a fucking fantastic year. So, thank you guys for joining me. I hope to hear your thoughts in the comments. If you thought the list should be switched around, if you think I missed something, should have added something, go ahead and throw your own list down there. Maybe, uh, you know, somebody else can get some ideas from, from your list and that somebody else might be me. <laughs> I'll be like, oh, I haven't heard of this game. Let's look it up. So, yeah, I appreciate you guys, each and every one of you. I hope you're staying safe out there. I hope that the new year is fucking good to you. I, f I hope it's fucking good to all of us. Thank you, friends, once again for watching. I've been Brandon Dayton, your humble narrator. This has been my top 10 indie games of 2019. I shall see you in 2020. Thank you so much for watching, friends. Check out the links in the description. Twitter, Discord, Patreon. Big shout out to Nico the Legend for supporting on Patreon. I'll see you guys in the next one. And until then, bye bye One, two, three. Goodbye, goodbye, see you again Goodbye, goodbye, see you, my friend